you know, if you've got a range of, of flesh tones, then basically all you have to do is choose the right one and put it in. Um, whereas we're focusing more on how to, you know, beat it from scratch and unfuck something you may have. <laughs> if you've started going yeah. down the orange route, you need to know how to get out of that. We should call um, this the... how to unfuck your color. <laughs> A glass of is that Chablis? I don't drinking know. Water? Um, Pinot Grigio. Clean. I'm not sure. Ching ching. Ooh, yum. <laughs> well, it's not been a terrible day at all, but I just thought, seeing as I can drink, it's in my own <laughs> workshop. Um, I thought I would. You're going to hear the occasional um, tink of the thermostat because I've got a heater in here that I've had on for a couple of hours to make the nice, warm, toasty workshop. This ins- this workshop is insulated really well, but it is cold today. It is really cold. Yeah, we're supposed so. to start getting some snow beginning part of the week, maybe maybe this weekend. It's decent outside right now. Yeah, we've had a lot of um, wind and rain and, and various um, pseudo-hurricane type that was the stuff that was in new york has drifted across this way now so it's kind of a lesser version of it but yeah, yesterday was kind of windy stuff. here so something that is blowing in from the west this has been a while hasn't it uh it has around <laughs> but i think i'm quite um quite excited about how this one's gone the whole color yeah, theory thing got something good this time <laughs> i don't know i think we did too bad last time uh yeah it is about time so basically we we, we we're doing a, a like a three-part article which we've um we're, we've done part two of for Neil's prosthetic magazine, Neil Gorton's prosthetics magazine, which is um, a good read. I think you've got the second one too. Uh, the great production value too. The photographs. I think it's well produced ma- magazine. Cool as Neil. Yeah, no, it's it's a, a it's a good read, and it's it's the kind of thing I think I would have loved to have read. I've been not that I didn't enjoy reading Gorzone and all those kind of you know the Caglian and Drexler labs and stuff, and that, that was amazing. But this is just wall to wall how stuff is done prosthetics it's it's a, a, yeah and it, there's class. no beauty and straight makeup in it it's all makeup effects and prosthetics and i think it's going to be a great resource for people that are just get, getting into this field they want to learn some fantastic new techniques mm-hmm. by some really really talented people <laughs> <laughs> not me not me i'm i'm not talking, I'm talking about about you say, and, and Mike Mike McCash and and Mr. G himself. Uh, some, yeah, no, this, I feel very stellar, fortunate to be stuff. to be part of this magazine. So we were writing. So we we were figuring out what to do, and we thought color theory was a good one because it's one of the things I think you probably found the same when you teach prosthetics. It's one of the things that I think throws a lot of people because it doesn't seem particularly relevant to prosthetics, but it, but it is, and uh, and it just oh, exploded, it's didn't it? I think it's huge. <laughs> But it just exploded. Like writing the first part was like, you know, we kind of do the theory of it. And then we came to write the second one and we basically doubled our word count. Oh, I know. It was uh, insane. And um, I just kind of thought about all the things. A lot more, things, a lot like, more images as well. Oh, a lot of images. So, there's, so there's, we, we kind of figured this would make a good podcast too. Uh, largely because I think the whole thing was, you know, we all did something with this as well. We actually mixed up stuff and, you know, I videoed some, some silicon and I mixed up. And uh, I, I find that when I do things, things pop up into my head. So uh, it, it, it's good to me, for me to be able to go, you know, rather than just sit remotely, actually make something go, oh, yeah, this is a thing that you need to remember. You know, I, I, I kind of forget that you need to know that sometimes. So it's, it's well, good to it, go through it's, it's doing critical. it. It's critical if your makeup is going to gonna read believable. You've got to be able to match in tone of, of your actor if you know if their face isn't completely covered with prosthetics if you're doing subtle little pieces everything's got to match or you've blown the illusion completely yeah i mean i think this is one of the things that um perhaps isn't immediately obvious is when you do something that's like completely covers the head basically like a big mask in some ways it's kind of easier to get away with that because you haven't got that direct you know, relationship with the skin next to it. Whereas if you just put like a, you know, a nose and a pair of eye bags on, most of that face is real skin with just right. a couple of fake things that you put on. So there's a lot of pressure on you to, to get that looking the same as everything else. And that's actually, even though it's a, a smaller thing, it's actually harder to do well. Um, and color theory really plays into that. And it, it occurred to me that, you know, for all the makeup side of stuff, um, you can really fuck it in the first five minutes by just mixing a terrible base coat, oh, you know, yeah, base yeah, material. Yeah. So, I thought it would be a really good thing to actually video 
um, the uh, the mixing of the silicon because you know you buy your silicon it's not cheap stuff this stuff is you know fairly expensive so what you don't want to do is is get you know a couple of kilos of silicon mixed up and turn into like a, a hideous smurf or some some kind of color you didn't intend to achieve so right. i thought unfortunately there are a number of different pigments that you can choose from to color your silicone it doesn't necessarily have to be a silicone pigment mm-hmm. uh, there are a lot of things that we can use to color it some that that i've found that people a lot of people were unaware of uh, well, like you mentioned to me acrylics, for and I, <laughs> yeah. I was really. In fact, last uh, week I, I posted a, a teaser image on Facebook last week of some silicone that I had base tinted using nothing but primary red, yellow, blue, and and some Liquitex paint, and boy, the responses from the tease were way more than I was expecting to to see. That I think we've 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 touched a nerve here with color theory stuff. So you mentioned about uh, acrylics, and I personally have never done it, and I was a little, not dubious, but I was like, I haven't seen that done. So you've used acrylic paint to mix up uh, what was I have. I've, I've 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 done it. Um, I've used the, the Liquitex Vivid Lime Green to tint the platinum silicone I was using to make some gloves for a production of Shrek, and I've now done additional gloves for several different productions of Shrek and. The gloves have held up beautifully. It's not leaching any 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 oils, nothing out of it. The, the silicone's holding up fine. It's not not breaking down at all. You had mentioned possibly that metals might affect the uh, the cure of some of the silicones. You know, like in, in cadmium yellow, for example, and titanium white. But when I mixed this base piece uh, as a just as a test to use in the, in this article. I did uh, um, equal parts red, yellow, blue, and then maybe six times that overall amount of white to fade it out to get a real, real soft base. This is acrylic paint, yeah. It's the acrylic paint, but using mm-hmm. titanium white to lighten it, mm-hmm. and I saw no cure inhibition whatsoever. The silicone still is just as as stretchy and and pliant as you would expect it to be if it had not been tinted at all. Sure, okay. I mean, it, but it I still recommend me. doing a doing a small test, you know, don't just take my word for it because maybe maybe I'm just a fluke of nature when it comes to using the acrylics, um, but I have had no problems with it whatsoever, but if there's any doubt, always do a little test. Mm-hmm. I mean, it occurred to me that the I don't actually know if there is any cadmium in cadmium red. For example, I assume there is, but I don't know if it's just they used to use cadmium, cadmium red, and now they've made it the same color using artificial pigments. And whether or not there is actually Perhaps. cadmium in, in 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 only oil paints, but not acrylics, because I'd never before you mentioned the acrylic thing, I've never heard of acrylics being used. So I just assumed because I have used oil paints with like tin silicons, like when we were used to paint um, things, we used the silicon caulking, we would tin sure. that with um, with oil paints because you know that stuff just goes off. Whereas uh, things like plat gels. They tend to be sensitive. And I have used, in a fix, I used um, some oil paint. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I used oil paint because I'd run out of silicon pigments. And it did completely screw up my, my silicon mix. So, yeah, no, I've that, used, I've, I've used that's the acrylic scared color. me off altogether, basically. I, I just thought, well, I've got silicon pigments. I'll use silicon pigments. But I sure. think it's great acrylics work because that, that's, a, that's a big deal because people can lay their hands on acrylic paints relatively easily. Oh, from a cost to, standpoint, it's a lot less expensive than oil paints. Yeah. And also, pigments. yeah, but also you get the range of colors too, which is really good. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so you don't way. actually have to be mixing primary plus white. You could find a, a nice flesh tone that's already pretty close to what you need it to be, and then adjust it afterwards when you when you go and do your your finish paint job on smooth on silicones and Polytech, and same results. Good stuff. <laughs> So I think we should probably go through like uh, like, like like the bullet points of other things and then chat about those things and space them out uh, just so we sort of keep in time with the article. Okay. Um, I've made a quick note of the headings and I think that'll help us kind of keep uh, on track and then we can spend like a few minutes on each one. Um, so I guess we start off with um, with basically the pigment and the color theory. Um, you know, the the first part of the article we did was basically about the theory, the color theory and, and you know, how it works. But that this second... Um, 
article really or the second part of the article is, is is specifically about a practical application that is actually taking that color theory and then using it in a in a real situation and in this case we figured mixing up uh, a base tone of silicon and, and you did some gelatin too um did some gelatin uh, um foam latex uh yeah the gelatin is exactly the same you can find flocking uh in the primary colors and mix it up exactly the same way and you get these fibers suspended in the gelatin that give you that a real a real depth mm -hmm. that of course can't get with foam latex because just the nature of that material it's opaque mm -hmm. that's true i have used uh i did a video on it a while back but i used some um i had some uh gelatin colors which i think are just like food coloring basically suspended in i don't know probably glycerin or something like that yeah. but um i used a uh, uh, grease paint as well because the grease melts with the with the molten gelatin so it disperses very well um so i had some old grease paints i used for that and that, that worked very well too but um but uh, for, is, for coloring the bondo doing prosade transfers i've and coloring that i've actually used watercolor uh transparent watercolor to mix in with the bondo and gotten really good results with that okay because so i guess that keeps that nice translucency as well which yeah which you need for that stuff um, so yeah, so it was good basically to go through a series of practical applications, actually showing some of this stuff being mixed up. Cause like I say, I think it's all well and good being able to paint the piece beautifully, but what you don't want to do is, is, is screw up your material that you've made it out of first by mixing that a bad color. Right. You don't want to be spending your makeup time trying to, you know, unfuck the terrible base color, basically. <laughs> it, should be, it should be, it should be a joyous part a and be mixing it. You had a great suggestion where mix pre mixing your color and adding a little bit at a time rather than trying to put in a little red, a little little yellow and a little blue into your part A or part A and swirling it up and then realizing, oh, okay, I got too much red or you got too much blue and then then you've just completely screwed that up. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna screw it up, screw it up before you put it in any silicone and yeah, and adjust it. Yeah, mix it up as a thing, or, then, or just do a small a amount. Expensive well, failure. This is it. I mean, if you're going to mix up like five liters for a job, maybe mix up you know half a cup first, and just see, and then you kind of get your eye in and say, oh, okay, I need a lot more red than I thought I did, mm -hmm. rather than oh, the whole thing's messed up. Um, so the base tone or the foundation, there's obviously the silicon pigments, which you can use to pigment it. Um, but you were talking about like uh, oil. Uh, well, we're going to try and avoid oils, but acrylic, acrylic paints, acrylic paints. Works. But I guess again, do a test because it could be brand specific. And I would imagine, I don't know, but I would imagine, you know, you can get like Liquitex and you can get like De La Rowney, but you can also get like really cheap, shitty kind of yeah. Uh, brand who knows what they put in some of that stuff? So, but so you could try. I'm, I'm not. I'm not down on the on the unmarked acrylics. I'm just saying, tr whatever you do, don't commit like five kilos of silicon or you know a gallon of silicon to to an unknown thing i would i would suggest you mix a small amount and check it goes off mix a little bit of in of the color into the a a middle bit of a and b together and then just time it and just see if it goes off because if you if it doesn't go off then you know that on a very small scale rather than oh i mixed up a five gallon tub with this stuff and then yeah. find out and it all of that it may it may it may change the the cure rate as well i've noticed that uh, on some of the the shrek gloves that i was making um, I have to do some normal wear and tear repair work, and I would use smooth on silpoxy, which is you know a one part silicone caulk basically, and add the the lime green acrylic to that. And the silpoxy's got a, like a twelve minute cure okay. ordinarily. When I add the color to it, it the goes off in system. about a minute and a half. Yeah, add add it to that. It it shortens the cure time exponentially. Okay, that's interesting. That is interesting. I mean, I wonder if it has anything to do with the water content. Oh, there's a lot of water in there, but I it remember, probably it probably does. I remember Colin Ware doing something years ago on, on Private Ryan, and he was making these guts out of that stuff, and he basically mixed up some water in with the um, with the um, the corking and the pigments and stuff, and then he basically wrapped them. He 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 kind of deposited like a length of this stuff into some cling film, you know, like sandwich mm -hmm. wrap plastic wrap and then wrapped it up and of course it wasn't exposed to air once it was wrapped up but there was oxygen in the mixture because there was some water that was mixed it kind of acted like a catalyst that was my yeah. understanding whether or not yeah. he yeah. added some catalyst in there too but with the, the so maybe that that's why. 
Yeah, yeah condensation cures will will go off a lot faster that way. Sure. So maybe that that, that kind of heated that. Um, so that's good. So so we got those different kind of things and flocking as well, which we'll look at. Um, and I, one thing I think is a really good thing to do if you can is to mix it in daylight or to at least check it in the daylight because I've done this where I've mixed up a color under a you know indoors under fluorescent lights and it looks great and then I take it outside and suddenly it's like bright orange. And like the blueness, <laughs> the blueness of your your fluorescent lights has killed right. that off. You no, know until you go outside and you go, oh man, this is well wrong. Because um, obviously you can't predict what lighting you're going to be filming under. But I, I kind of maintain if you make it look like the skin, there's a good chance the piece will change like the skin will change. Because that's the which is one reason why I've changed all of the the fluorescent bulbs in my shop to to daylight mm-hmm. bulbs so that I'm getting a more realistic. Lighting. Sure. And I mean, I know how it is. Sometimes, you know, it's late. You don't, you have to do this at night. There isn't any day. So you kind of have to try and do what you can. And that's why I think, yeah, daylight bulbs are good. And they're not, they're not exactly the same, but they, they, they help. <laughs> but if you can check in the daylight as well, I mean, I think it's good, you know, to take it out in several different lights and just see if it's different, you know, in each light, if it's the same kind of different sure. compared to the skin you're trying to check. Um, I mean, something that was really, really good that um, Alexandra Wathy did for um, Game of Thrones, She, we, we made like a kind of a base with a head shape cut out of it. And she mixed up, I think, about 30 or 40, maybe more different color skin samples. And she poured them up in you know, cups. It took a while to do all this. But it meant when someone came in for a life class, what we would do is hold this thing over their head. And they had this like halo of, of different colored discs. Uh, and we'd number them. And then basically when you took a photo, you would look later and you could see what their skin looked like. And she would also, on occasion, if, if we had time, she would actually mix up some of the base color too with, with them there. And, and pretty quick, she was very, you know, could, could knock out a very good skin tone. But it meant that you could say, oh, this guy's at 37. And then when he wasn't there, you had something that you know was pretty close to him uh, or to, to, you know, to reference when you were mixing up your, your skin color later. So That's a I know that idea. is yeah. A reasonable thing to do because not everyone's got the time to mix up. But you took a, a photo for the article where you hold up, you know, a couple of skin illustrator palettes, and it's kind of handy to do that because I was looking at that and going, "Oh, he's paler than this, but darker than that," and it gives you some kind of ballpark to aim at because I find it very, it's quite an abstract thing to see a person's skin and then turn that into a color and saying, "Okay, it's yellow than that, or redder than this, or whatever." And when you when you offer up things that are just color then you can say, oh, okay, you're somewhere between those two, and then it kind of helps focus your your eye a bit. Yeah, and I noticed also that the piece that I had, the silicone that I had tinted with primaries and white and laid it across my forearm to show how close it was to my base tone, when you do this, mm-hmm. the squint the squint thing, when you kind of squint your eyes and look at it, mm-hmm. it even, even gets a, a tighter... Uh, representation of what that base is and it matched almost perfectly to my base skin yeah. tone yeah I, in fact that that <clears throat> what you suggest that's actually something i i did recently on a, on a sculpting class uh, was i I, uh, I i took some photographs to explain the difference between form and texture um I, I had some photographs and i blurred them and i think it would work the same for photographs as well if you were trying to figure out color wise if you blur an image so you're you know, obviously there's a de- there's degrees of blurriness, but you could blur it enough that you're kind of not distracted by the minutiae and you can actually say, oh, this is roughly where the darks are. This is r- roughly where the reds are. And it, it enables you to not get distracted by the, the detail, you know, the hairs and everything. You're actually just seeing it as a series of colors. So the fact you mentioned that, like squinting, is, is kind of, you know, it, it's basically like a digital squint. <laughs> it's kind of a yeah, you know, exactly. way of doing that. So and you, you can, can al- also look at the back of your hand and the different the color variants that you'll see in the back of your hand are going to be a pretty close representation of the same variants you're going to find in your face. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, they're kind of reds and the, the greens. And I'm just looking at the back of my hand now. It's quite funny actually how like looking at something like that is it's it's difficult to kind of explain. You do need to kind of adjust. It's like kind of um, you know like when you when I think the, the best way to describe it is when you when you're outside in a bright sunlight and you go into a dark room very suddenly and suddenly your eyes take a while to adjust. Like if you go into a cinema or something, it takes a while for your eye to kind of adjust to the darkness. Mm-hmm. And I think the same is true of colors. When you're, when you are required to paint something and, and put those colors in the right places, it kind of takes you a while to, to tune your eyes, to be able to see them. And I think you need to allow time for that because otherwise you just start slapping paint. and go, Oh, I'm going to start painting. And actually what you're doing is, you know, 
you may be putting colors in the wrong places because you need to kind of just give your eyes a chance to adjust and the more you do it the more you start seeing oh there is actually blue there it's not a smear of blue but it's just a bluer tint of the skin and, and it's it's adding those things right. you know. rod maxwell has a has an app uh for iphones and and ipads called um flesh master and it's kind of a kind of a game but it's also a reference chart that helps do exactly what you just described teaching you how to recognize what tones are within a a, a certain palette of just someone's face or or torso or hand where you'll see those Never heard of that. Those little, little that bits of, of yellows or those greens and blues that that pop up that unless you're looking for it or you're not going to notice that it's there and it helps you to recognize where where these different shades are it's Amazing. called flesh master i'm gonna write that down flesh master i if i google that i'm worried i may find all kinds of things <laughs> come up on some, <laughs> some government uh <laughs> the, oh, the domain is not taken i'm like yeah i'm not surprised um, that's, <laughs> okay i'll look that up that's brilliant that's really really cool oh, i love that i think that it's a dollar 99 to buy it okay i'll look that up so um so mixing i mean i noticed something quite interesting is I, i'm kind of lazy so i started with a basic flesh tone and i so i have you know a bunch of different silicon pigments and i got two flesh tones one's darker than the other so i tend to start with a flesh tone and then I will adjust that flesh tone with blues and greens and reds because, to be honest, the basic flesh tone is is often very orange. So I need to put a lot of blue right. in just to kill that kill that off. But you didn't, did you? You started with with uh, white, I think, and uh, primaries. You went the kind of the yeah. I, I I did equal thorough. equal amounts of red, blue, and green, which kind of gets almost a burgundy brown. Mm-hmm. And then adding, just continue to add white until it mellowed out okay. to, to where I want to be. But, you know, if you're doing darker skin colors, it's a great place to start. Yes, because it's interesting the amount of people equal, that. Equal I've amounts that. of red, blue, and yellow are going to give you a really nice, rich skin tone for dark mm-hmm. skin. And the yellowness, I think, is, is important because there's a lot of... Uh, I mean, I hesitate when, I, when I've done the video of this, uh, you know, these skin tones I mixed up. I was hesitant to kind of go into the browns because the trouble is you could get, you know, uh, t- you could go to 10 different companies and get 10 different browns, you know, in, in, in the mm-hmm. comments. Uh, and they'll all be different types of brown and, and they may not necessarily be right for the skin. And a lot of them are very sort of ashy looking, um, whereas there's a lot of warmth in a lot of darker skin. So I think yellow is one of those colors that's very yellow and red is, you know, like you say, it's those primary colors, but a lot more of that than you may realize to you know, to, to give it the heat, the warmth that it needs to look like living skin. It's not just a brown, you know. It's, right. Um, starting I think with, with PPI it, has know. done a great job with their dark flesh tone palette. Oh, there's some colors in there that I haven't it's, even had to yeah, mix. I could beautiful. use it straight. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, they're very good. Uh, and a lot of paler colors than you might think as well, because, again, you know, dark skin, there's, 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 as, <laughs> there's as much range of dark skin than there is, a, you know, pale or medium, whatever. It's... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a big sliding scale, and um, it's interesting. And um, you mentioned before as well, and I did a, a blog post about it a while about about using like Photoshop to kind of isolate, you know, yes, to take an image the, of something and the, isolate. The color that picker pixel. is is a great place to start to get you that jumping off point. If you're using the the CMYK picker, find your go around and get your little picker in the in the color area, and it's going to give you actual percentages of your primary colors and black mm-hmm. to mix it up so you can figure out a percentage pretty easily to get you in the ballpark quickly and then you tweak it to, to get exactly what you're looking for mm. and it also clues you in on as, as, to, as to what something's made up of because you know you may do that to an image so you take a photograph of your actor which presumably you will have done you've got your mm-hmm. performer. um and like you say you could check on several different places on the face and um you can see like you say what those colors are, are, are composed of in terms of you know, CMYK, and it's like, wow, you could say there's, there's more blue in there than I realized. You know, if you're trying to mix exactly. it and it's not working, it may just be that it needs blue. Um, so if you're going to try something, something I also recommended was um, to take a little sample. So if you're mixing up like, you know, a liter of something or a kilo or, you know, half gallon or something, you know, a large quantity of silicon that you're worried about screwing up, you could take a small amount, like a tablespoonful and put it on, you know, a palette and mix a tiny bit of that color that you you were thinking of putting it just to see what it does to that mm-hmm. mix. And if it completely trashes it, you've isolated that mess to just a very small amount of silicon. You know, it's a small price to pay. And then once you're happy with what that color is going to do, 
Um, and you're only out like, pennies and a few minutes of your time. Exactly. And you haven't ruined the whole thing. Because one thing that I did think about was, I mean, the, the pigments I've got, you could buy a red pigment in one place and a red pigment from the other, and they may be different pigments. Because uh, I found something that's quite tricky. Is it, it seems quite tricky to find primary, pure primary um, colors. Like the, the, the blue is, is often very dark or it has white yeah. in it to give it brightness. Um, and you can't really find magenta easily. You know, you get a, a kind of a pillar box red, which has got a lot more yellow in it. Yeah, so, and that will throw things off. It will throw things off. But that's why the whole color theory comes into practice, because it's about uh, adjusting what you have, not, not, oh, I need to start with a magenta. But if you don't have magenta, maybe you just need to add blue and a bit of, you know, more red to make a kind of a purpley color to kill off the yellowness of the red that you have. I mean, it, it almost doesn't really matter. You know, as long as you've got a good range of colors, you should be able to make up a, you know, a, a goodish, reasonably close uh, skin tone with them just by applying the theory of color, which is you know, correcting things accordingly by adding the right amount of, of whatever you need. The Fuse Effects, uh, Canadian company Fuse Effects that, that, that Guy started years ago, mm-hmm. has a wonderful range of, of pre-mixed uh, silicone pigments to use for all these different flesh tones. I had a um, similar over here. I've got, I've got a, and I put them in the video. I had some from a company called Principality in Wales, and they have they make these really nice, you know, range of flesh tones, and uh, they are good. But the thing is about you know, if you've got a range of, of flesh tones, then basically all you have to do is choose the right one and put it in. Um, whereas we're focusing more on how to, you know beat it from scratch and unfuck something you may have <laughs> if you've started going yeah. down the orange route and you need to know how to get out of that we should call um, this then... how to unfuck your color there we go <laughs> and there's a certain amount you can do but maybe there, there's a certain point past which you can't unfuck you could or, or you may achieve the, the correct color but now the opacity is shot because there's, there's way too much pigment in there yeah um yeah and that's so, that's yeah. something you definitely want to try to avoid because it's 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 real easy to add too much yeah yeah, so a little is. bit I'll, at a time. That's why the the dot the dot on the mixing stick is so important when you're mixing mixing yes. all in. Because if you can't see the dot through the silicone, you've got way too much pigment. And if again, if this doesn't make any sense whatsoever, I will put a link to the video um, on this um, this blog post uh, because again, it, it really helps. I think it was Neil. I I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure Neil's the first person I've ever seen do it. So I, I attribute that to Neil Gorton. Yeah, that, I, that's, that where I, that's where I picked it up. Yeah, it's a, if it doesn't, if you've not seen it before, it's basically a little mixing stick that you would have wooden you know tongue depressor or waxing spatula whatever you want to call it and basically yeah you put the sharper you put a little dot at the bottom and then when you put it in your mix and stir you lift up the stick and if you can clearly see the black dot through it then there's not enough pigment in there and if you can't see it at all then there's too much pigment but it's a nice way of being able to be sure that you can actually quantify to some degree the opacity as you add your pigment it's a nice to be that's why i say start small add a little bit it's too translucent you'll gradually see it get more and more opaque and it's, it's it's a nice way of being able to gauge that because without that, you kind of – it's like watching your kids grow. You don't notice because it happens so gradually. So, you know, it's only when you start marking where their heads are on the side of a, you know, a door frame where you go, Christ, you know, you were that small ones. You know, you kind of forget. It's it's, it's like a, a speeded up version of that where yeah. you can suddenly go, oh, I've added way too much color. I didn't see that coming. Well, I, I was using this off. method the other day. I, I, I was making a couple of uh, slit throat appliances for – uh, a colleague over here is is doing something this weekend and wanted to run some tests, so I whipped up a couple of these pieces for her and had mixed the silicone exactly that way. And there was maybe an inch or so in a in a small cup left over afterwards. I I overmixed my my silicone, <laughs> but ran a test and to see how translucent it was. It's like a flashlight underneath the cup, and it was just like shining a flashlight through the fingers on my hand where it was darker in some places but lighter, but it definitely shone the light through it, and it was really cool. Because mm. I, I think I, people can I make it. I had some of images of that. Yeah. It was, it was exactly what it needed to be. That would look cool. That would look cool because, like you say, because when you strain you know, your hand over, you do get that kind of – at the edges where it tapers and gets thin – you get that kind of yeah. yellowy orange light coming through, and then it That's just That's exactly what was coming through the through the bottom of the cup. Excellent, yeah. Because I do think there is a danger because it's a translucent material that people tend to make it too translucent, you know. And it's uh, 
it, it's not good when that happens because it just looks weird. It doesn't look it looks waxy, and then when you put your colors on over the top, they appear to be sitting on like a kind of a see through glassy surface. Right. Uh, so yeah, it's it's not good when that happens. Um, and it's interesting. I mean. One thing I would notice as well, I see this a lot where people are coloring pieces for the first time, is that they will put, you know, even if the piece is made for them and it's been made the right translucency and the right base tone, people think in terms of putting a foundation over the top and they'll they'll hit a you know a translucent silicon piece, they'll they'll smother it with a flesh tone yeah. illustrator or something opaque, which is unnecessary and also just makes it look really flat and masky, which is the whole point of not using foam. <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. that's why you use silicon is because it is translucent. So you actually don't need a lot of colours really to, to 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 change it unless something's gone drastically wrong or they've got a lot of red in there. But again, we'll we'll do this when we do the application. I'm going to do some videos of that. The third part of this article is going to be actually making appliances and sticking them on using the same colour theory because I think it's important to see it all the way through. Agreed. Yeah. And good. you know, you can you can paint foam like it. I'm I'm not good enough to to do it but if you if you're a tom flouts you can paint foam latex to make it look absolutely translucent and oh you can absolutely yeah because because the, the thing is foam latex is opaque so to paint it skillfully to appear translucent is you know the right thing to be able to do i'm just saying if you actually have something that is translucent and then like an idiot you smother it in a thick layer of makeup and then you have to then on top of that be a skillful painter to replicate the translucency that you would have already had if you not put the bound thing, you know a thick foundation right. over the top then, then you know it, it, it's an extra skillful step that you didn't need to do um but yeah i mean i think uh, uh, another poll you know post on actually painting foam latex would be a good thing to do because it is one of those things that scares people uh and uh, it's a good thing to be able to do because here's the thing because latex is is cheap a lot of people do latex it happens to be a lot at colleges people want to do latex because latex and plaster is cheap but the flip side of that is you actually need to be more skillful to paint it like skin mm-hmm. whereas well, ironically you know it's, it's kind of you get what you pay for silicon is more expensive but it doesn't take a huge amount of painting to get it to the light skin if you've done it right so um, and it's not, you know, especially difficult. It's just you need to be aware of a few things, I think, and and and, and do it as well. I think it's one thing to to read about it, but you actually need to to do it wrong a few times and go, oh, okay, and step back. Yeah, and I and think, I think all- mistakes is a is a big part of the the learning process. You're not going to get better unless you make mistakes. No, it's true. But I I, I do remember seeing like the first time I'd ever seen someone stick on, you know, properly a foam makeup and the thing is when you got up close to it you could see that it was makeup it did look like makeup but what happened was in my head it, you know when you look on camera it, it looked perfect but it's it's that it's that accepting that 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 um that difference between you know what's 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 real and what's fake but it's painting the fake thing the right way for it to appear real mm-hmm. and it, it's it was reassuring for me to see something that was amazing and looked great on camera but you know that when you got up close to it you could see that it was makeup but it's just a case of but you also saw where the specks of color and everything were put in order to make it appear on camera like it was correct. So that was a good lesson for me because it was like, oh, OK, I see. Because when you when you're doing it yourself and you can still see that it's color. Well, of course you can, because you, you were there from the start. So you, you're familiar with all of the processes. So you beat yourself up thinking that you're doing it wrong because you can identify where the makeup is. And actually, that's not the case at all. It's It's, it's just putting the things in the right places. But. It still kind of looks like makeup when you get up really, really close. It's just the fact that it's done skillfully that the color is in the right place, and on camera it will it will look good. Yeah, I, I think that's a perfect example. Um, there's some some photos of a uh, makeup I did for a Star's uh, Halloween movies on demand uh, back in 2009 uh, on a on a dark skinned actor, and we did a foam vampire forehead on him. Mm-hmm. And then you. This is the one that's in the article. Yes, yeah, the one that's in the, the article. And if you look at it up close, you can you can see some of the fleck material. But on camera, it it you can't tell that it's that it's not his his forehead. You know, if you got you know like the Nutty Professor makeup on Eddie Murphy, which looks astounding and is foam. But if you were to in real life put that next to somebody else who had you know, who's dark skin and exactly the same, but they were a real person, you would be able to see the difference, I believe. It's just that you would you would say, oh, but it really does look like skin. But it, it and that's kind of what I'm saying. When you when you're in the business of, of, of sticking on bits of rubber and coloring them, 
there's a danger that you could be doing things right, but you're worrying about the wrong things. And because it, you know what I mean? It, because, it, yeah. because it doesn't look absolutely flawless. You're like, well, I can't do it. I'm snappy brushes in half. It's like, you know, if you were to see something like, you know, Rick Baker's makeup, it would still look astounding. But if you got up right close, I mean, like an inch away with your eyes, not with a camera, with your eyes, and look right next to someone with, you know, dark skin who's real without any prosthetics, you'd be like, I can see there is a difference. And it would kind of relax your mind a bit because you realize that, you know, it, it, it's amazing, but it is an amazing makeup. It's not completely completely flawless and there there have been prosthetics i've seen that you know look great on camera but I, I do think when you get up really close you can see and this is the thing if you're doing your own makeup on somebody you can get up close and you can see yourself so but it I works just to kind but of it works through the context that you're creating it for you know absolutely that's what i'm we're, saying we're but, in the but, business of creating illusions we are but i'm just saying when you when you're a student trying to sell that illusion and we can either sell yeah. well or sell it poorly that's right but what i'm saying when, you, when you're a student of it you 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 kind of compare yourself to ridiculously high standards, which are. I'm not saying it, it's not a license to be shit. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, yeah, most I people who are trying to do it don't get to go up to a Rick Baker makeup and look at it really close. They see the photos in the magazine, and it does look amazing. But what I'm saying is, if you, I I think you would actually be able to see that it is makeup, and that's quite an important thing to know if you've never seen a, a brilliant prosthetic makeup applied by somebody else is that when you get up really, really close, you can actually see, more often than not, elements of it that are fake. And that, that's reassuring from someone who's going to want to make it. Right. Um, because, well, you should be... I'm not saying it's a, that it should look bad. What I'm saying is it, it makes you realise what you should be worried about. That you need to put, you need to put the right colour of packs on there, the right colour of grease paint on there, for it to appear real, if you're going to do a flat... Or the same with the translucent makeup. It has to look like skin, and it... it, it there's, there's nothing like it. This is why watching someone like Neil do demos is great because you'll see him do the whole thing like an hour and you'll see him put the reds on. And it's like when you see the final makeup, if you hadn't seen the process, you would swear it was a real face. But because you've seen him put big blotches of red on the nose and it happened when we um, we did something at the prosthetics event, we did the, the Lauren and Hardy makeup and, mm -hmm. you know, it, the reds on his nose, they look real. But when you see him first put them on, it, you know, in isolation, you might think, oh, that's way too much red. But it isn't. It's the correct amount of red. And that's kind of what I'm trying to say. You want someone to worry about the right things so that they realize, oh, there is that much red in. You know? And it happens a lot when you take pieces off. You look at them later in the workshop, you go, wow, that's a lot of red on there. But you go, yeah, but that's how much you have to add for it to look like it's supposed to be on his face. You know, that, that's kind of what I mean. So you, you worry about the right things rather than sort of beat yourself up to this impossible standard that you've basically invented in your own head from photographs or, you know, um, video footage of, of something that's been very carefully lit and edited and presented in such a way and possibly even digitally, you know, affected to, to kind of patch things up. So I think it's good to be able to, I think what I'm trying to say is it, you need to see these things done for real. So going to places like IMATS and trade shows to see these things, but also yeah, except you may not. Don't stress yourselves out unnecessarily. Yeah, about things because the best makeups in the world still kind of look like makeups is my point. Um, but the trick is to do it well so it, it looks like a good makeup. So it, you know. And to do it well just requires practice. Yeah, and making a lot of mistakes. Practice and making a lot of mistakes so that yeah. you know what not to do next time. And at some point, you hope you the the amount of mistakes you're making are extremely minimized and you're doing things right. But, you know, getting good at this is all about getting outside your comfort zone until you feel comfortable doing something, and then you push yourself outside that comfort zone again. It's the only mm -hmm. way to improve. It's true. Yeah, it's true. And it happens to me every single time. <laughs> still the same. Still the same. I'm still genuinely surprised when it all looks okay. I'm like, wow, <laughs> I got away with it again. <laughs> I, I think people do generally feel like that. It, 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 it's not a unique sensation in a way to, to feel i think i'm worried that the day i don't feel like that that's when you start sort of taking things for granted it will go hard yeah well the day you don't feel that way then I, then i don't think you're trying hard enough anymore i just want to mention a little bit about uh, adding colors to things that don't seem flesh like um like putting blue and green into things because like, uh, mm -hmm. when i when i've mixed up colors with students a lot of them are like you're putting blue in that and it's like yeah but it's not that you want him to look like he is blue. Now, unless you're trying to do like a mystique something, it's supposed to be blue. But with, with normal flesh tones, 
uh, a lot of the time I find you're, you're actually sort of fight, not fighting, but you're, you've got to work with the, the, the colors you've got. And if the color you have is a bit too orange, you may need to add blue to offset that orangeness. It's not because you it want will, it to look it blue. that warmth out of it. That it just, that's exactly it. It just knocks the warmth out. So it's working with the orange to reduce the oranginess of it to make it a blue tone. Yeah, no, and obviously, I, and too much blue is going to gonna make that orange gray. Yeah. So that's why you want to use something like a pin or something, because I found some blues... I mean, I think this is where flocking is superior in some ways. Adjustment, little crazy colors like that. Blue mm. flock or green flock is really handy because it doesn't, it doesn't surprise you suddenly. You know, you can put a, bit of, a pinch of green flock in. It's not going to suddenly reveal itself to be like an uber ninja green and, and, and completely destroy everything. Whereas pigments, you know, what, I put like a speck of blue like in that. and it's like, oh, you know, it's ruined it. Yeah, well, with the flocking, it's kind of like going back to the, to the squint factor or the slightly out of focus. You know, when you're looking at it all mixed together, Together, it looks really, really natural. But if you get in really tight on it, you can see those little flecks of green or those little flecks of blue mixed in with the red and, and the yellow and, and the white. But further out, it's a, it's a nice flesh tone, but you get zoom in real tight and it's easy to pick out those little individual flecks of color. It is. And here's something else I've noticed. Um, when you're mixing up the skin, you, you tend to judge it by how it looks on the tongue stick. And when you, when, mm -hmm. you, when you scoop it up with the tongue stick, it's smooth and shiny because it's just free-flowing silicon that's not curing. But when you, when you run an appliance, it has a textured surface. And because of that, it has a different finish. It's not the same as a shiny, smooth tongue stick that's just been dunked in, in, in fresh, uncatalyzed silicon. Right. So, so you may have that color, and you could pour that and run a piece, and it's got a cat plastic band, you've talked it. And when you look at that, it'll look different than if you have that same mix part a and you're looking at the color and the tongue stick they won't look necessarily exactly the same so something better something good happens when so you you fight to get the color as close as you can in the cup but actually when you run the piece you'll find i have found that it's quite forgiving once it actually comes out in the appliance agree about yeah. it being a textured surface because i think when it's smooth and shiny it isn't the same as skin because most skin isn't smooth and shiny it has a, a skin texture to it of some degree mm -hmm. and that's what you have in your sculpted appliance but you don't have it in the cup so that there is something to be said for actually running a little bit and seeing you know uh, what it looks like too and most appliances aren't going to be really thick heavy deep appliances they're going to be fairly fairly subtle ought to be and with with nice feathered edges so with that translucency of the properly colored silicone gluing on to your actor's skin then you're going to also get a little bit of a benefit of the actor's own skin tone showing through in, in in some of those thinner areas to help blend that color even more absolutely yeah the, the skin tone because like you say there's no sudden stopping or starting point you get a, a gradual shift from from fake to real and, yep. that, and that helps because then you know when you when you paint you paint the same way you gradually fade out um but with it with i was gonna say with the drops of pigment uh the blue and the green pigment i, I use like a pinhead or something just to be safe <laughs> oh yeah because it just uh, takes a very very tiny amount and it's easy to to go overboard it is i mean when you squeeze, I mean, the, the, the actual bottles I've got, they've got like a little nozzle, you know, like a little tiny nozzle. And when you squeeze that, you can squeeze that the smallest amount that it can deliver. That may that's still too be much. too much blue. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's why I put it into a little pot. But again, that, that's kind of covered in the video. But if you're, if you're going to be using blues and, and greens to tweak something, it's just, uh, yeah, proceed with caution. And then if you find using you know, like a pinhead's amount is not doing anything, then by all means proceed a bit more confidently. But my, I, I just say start with the pinhead is all. Just a tiny bit of pigment popped in and, and see what it does. Some silicone pigments um, aren't quite as, as rich as others where you know, the, the color is, is, I'm not sure the right word, but... The fuse effects ones are nice. I've used some where I've had to dump in a ton of color to see any any kind of effect, and others where just a few drops and everything's colored great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you may want to do some tests depending on which what kind of silicone pigment, whose pigments you're using. Um, some will require more pigment than others. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never used the fuse for it. I'd like to try the fuse fix. I might get a pack. Next I like it. I might get a pack and try them out. Because the thing is, you know, here I'm trying to, you know, we're trying to kind of 
show people and uh, I'm the same when I do classes. I really want people to get inside how to mix up the skin tones. But when I'm in a hurry, I'm like, do you know what? If I can find something that's the right color, <laughs> I'll just dump that in there. That would save me a lot of time. So I might might yep. try those out. I have tried um, the Principality ones, which I've got, which are available mostly, I guess, in the UK because they come from Wales. They're quite good, but they're not that concentrated, which is good and bad. It's good because that it's was very what I was looking for concentrated concentrated yeah it, it, it's good that they're not too concentrated these particular ones because it's very difficult to put accidentally too much in so you've got a lot of leeway with it but at the same time it's also bad because you have to put half a bottle in to, to you know mix up a decent amount so mm-hmm. i know i could buy buy you know a larger quantity of it but i kind of personally i kind of like the very concentrated ones the ones i've got here are the ones I used in the video, Mold Life. I have found personally that the they do two flesh tones. There's a one called Flesh Tone and one called Dark Flesh Tone, um, which is a bit of a misnomer. Misnomer. People have said, "Oh, but it's not you know for dark skin." I've used it, but it's about the same as you know my boy Caucasian skin. It's a darker pale skin tone. It's not a mm-hmm. dark skin tone. Um, uh, but of the two, I find the darker skin tone is more natural looking color. I find the the standard flesh tone is a little bit orange and needs quite yeah. a bit of blue to fix but that's not bad i'm just saying just you know you need to add your blues to it but uh but uh, i tend to start with the darker flesh tone but i, I kind of like the, the super concentrated ones because i'm normally i've mixed up enough silicon i don't tend to put way too much in to start with but uh i do like the the, the more concentrated ones because they, they go further as well you know well, one of the flesh tones from, from 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 fuse effects uh is s301 is is a pretty terrific base flesh tone mm-hmm. um, so all you've got to worry about any, is... without needing to do any any adjusting to it is, is so you don't nice. all you need to do is is concentrate on the amount you need so correct but again is it is it quite a fluid that you could drip in is it yeah is absolutely it yeah yeah okay so that's good so so it's easy for you to kind of drop in a couple of drops and see oh this is way too translucent but now i'm confident mm-hmm. that because there's nothing worse than putting a drip in and the whole thing is ruined already You're like oh well i i a warning would have been nice. <laughs> so it's good that it's got some. Yeah, no, I think, I think you'll like it when you try it. Awesome stuff. I think we'll just have a quick word on packs. I, I do think um, looking at opaque painting, you know, painting with things like Pax Paint would be a worthy video all of its own, to be honest, because I think definitely it would be good to, to kind of demonstrate that. And I don't claim to be like the world's best painter with, with anything, but uh, I can do a pretty possible uh you know skin with, with pax paint and i think once you kind of get your head around that i mean it would be great if we could maybe get some uh some people who are better than me to to, to come on and we can talk about what they do and the, te- the techniques they do but, uh, i gotta tell you I, I i don't know if you've used tom supernaut's um pax paints i uh, haven't used them but i've seen them and they look uh, like good they're colors. they're they are terrific I love him. He mixed up a custom one for me for Young Frankenstein that I absolutely love. But he's got uh, several different palettes, um, but his flesh tones are really nice. But if you're going to mix up your own, I recommend using the no-tack version of Prozade instead of the the regular so your your paint doesn't dry sticky. Really? Because that's the thing. I've used no tack, and the thing I don't like about it is it's shiny and not sticky. So you get the shine, but when you powder it, nothing happens because it's not sticky. Hmm. <laughs> so I guess you could spray it with uh, I don't know, like a. Sealer I wonder if the, I something. wonder if there's some kind of a mat that you mat uh, additive that could go in with it. Maybe. Well, the, 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 there's the Liquitex, um, you know, matting agent, which uh, I would imagine is all right. And there's obviously Ooh, that's you know, a good you know, good idea. Uh, yeah. Whether or not it affects the flexibility, I don't know, but um, you could do that. But uh, yeah, I, I remember trying it once and thinking, why does this exist? Because it has all the bad points. None of the good. <laughs> but I guess there is that. <laughs> there, there is that. You know, if you're doing like a neck appliance, it's nothing more annoying than you know. Oh, I think it was mostly developed as a to use as a sealer because it's real because it's real easy to if you're painting foam latex to you know it's, it's basically it's it's sponge rubber. Uh, you yeah. get your your paint. You wind up with a, a soaked appliance full of paint that never dries. So, so ADM Tronics, if you could come up with like a matte prosade, how about that? How'd that be? If you guys are listening, how about it? Because <laughs> if we're putting a matte agent on over the top, that happens all the time. 
Um, I mean, you know, we, you powder down actors' heads all the time anyway, without any prosthetics. So let's agree that shine is bad uh, and do whatever we can. So instead of concentrating your efforts on making something that's not sticky, let's concentrate on making it not shiny. Not shiny. That's more of a problem than the sticky. Because sticky I can powder, but not sticky and shiny, I can't do fucking anything with that, can I? That's on our <laughs> wish list now. Did you notice, I'm looking at I'm looking at some of the photographs of the Part 2 article, and mm-hmm. one of the images you dropped in uh, for mixing Pax paints, the blue, there's a face in it. Let me look that up. <laughs> you see this face? I mean, I can easily see this guy's got a nose and chin, and he's got like mutton chop sideburns. Uh, which one is it? Is it is it the one with all the nine different colors? Yeah. Uh, no, it's it's there's there's a like a flesh tone pool, and there's, there's red coming in from upper right. There's kind of a yellow green coming in. There's blue coming in from the from the bottom. Aaron Sims did a really really cool um, DVD and no no one video about creature design, and he was going on about oh I see it now I see it now yeah fuck it, 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 it's his right hand side. So you see his ear and his eye and his nose. Yeah, and, and he's got like, a big look, mutton chop sideburn. Yeah, as if you're looking from, kind of comes from up slightly above mustache. down. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, and he That's did the thing where it's like, you know, if you're looking at clouds and stuff, from, you know, you take a photo of a cloud, you can flip it. And, it, you know, if you're in Photoshop, you can find symmetry and, and flip it and make faces out of things. And it kind of takes you off on, on tangents. That That is, that's mad, yeah. I didn't see that before. How funny. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I think I think probably um, I think I think uh, uh, well there we go. I think that we, we've got our next um, post ready. There is, is Pax paint and, and painting Pax a paint. Opaque, paint, a paint th- well, just painting opaque. I think is the thing uh, uh, achieving translucency. You know, with opaque with, pigments. With, with, with opaque, yeah, because it's definitely a skill to acquire. Yeah, but also something that you know when you're you know, on a tight budget or you're starting out and you're doing folio stuff or you're doing even, you know, stuff that you can't run silicon or anything and you can't run necessarily found that you may end up making latex pieces because that's the cheapest and quickest way of doing something. Um, you're going to need to paint that that way. So it, it, it's not a bad thing to know. So basically, yeah, I mean, all this stuff is in the article, which will come out in the, the, the third magazine. Um, but it, it was just, I just, it just felt good to talk about it. I didn't think I was going to get so stuck into, um, the, the, the significance of actually seeing something with your own eyes rather than just seeing photographs of it. But I do stand mm-hmm. by that. I think, I think there's something about, there's something that happened in my brain when I saw my first prosthetic makeup that somebody else had applied that looked amazing. The the fact is you could actually see that it was made partly because I'd seen it done, but when you looked at your own skin and you looked at the finished makeup, this was bearing in mind foam latex and we talked about 20 years ago, but you could see that it wasn't real skin. And it, that, that made a lot of things okay in my head. So that when I was painting things, the fact that it still looked like painted foam didn't throw me off. It was just, I, I concentrated instead on making it the right color, but it would look like the right color of foam that had been painted. That's the point I was trying to kind of convey. It, it's not about, it's not an excuse to do a bad job. It's just that, you know, it, 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 it's it's almost impossible to make something look completely real to the eye. Right. Especially when I think that will be a source of some comfort to to newbies that aren't. That's satisfied. kind of where I'm going with this. That's, that's kind yeah. of what I meant. Because there's a difference between someone wearing a makeup and performing a scene in it. Because the makeup is not necessarily the focus of the scene. You know, if you've got someone who's wearing prosthetics and they're you know, in character and they're giving a speech and there's stuff happening. That's not the only thing you're looking at. But when you are doing a makeup for yourself, all you're looking at is the makeup that you have done. And it's all in, all consuming and all compassing. And the bit of software that we will have in our head that that convinces us that what we're doing is, is not good enough and we're terrible and we don't deserve success will tell you that the fact that it looks like that is because you're terrible and you're crap. And it's like, no, that's because it's an opaque material. That's what it looks like. It's just, it needs to be a bit yellower or a bit greener, or maybe your paint job could be a bit more broken up. But that's not what you notice. You just notice the fact it doesn't look real. 
and so you get hung up on it. And I, I think yeah. there was something very valuable that happened in my head when I saw that for the first time by someone. I think it was Danny Parker that stuck a, a Richard III test makeup on. It looked amazing, but I could still see that it was makeup when I looked at it. And then when I saw photographs and I saw it in the movie, it looked astounding. And I was like, oh, okay. And it filled in a load of blanks in my head. that mm, Light bulb going that, on over your that, head. That, that good, good makeups still look like makeups. And my job was to, to, was to put the colors in the right, the right colors in the right places. That was it. And it was like, oh, I get it now. It's not about turning paint into skin. It's about knowing where the paints have to go in order to have the illusion of skin. That's a different thing. That's kind of where I was going with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, mix up right color, put it in the right place. There that's you go. basically it. It's like sculpting, isn't it? It's like make the right yeah. shape in the right place. And that's it. <laughs> it's just, uh, what is it? Life, life is simple, but it's not easy. <laughs> or something. Well, life is complicated, <laughs> but it's not easy. There's some, uh, but it's true. And it's the same with this kind of stuff. It's, it, 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 it's simple, but it's not easy to do. It's, you know, it's, uh, it, it, the hard part well, is achieving it. Comes, it's not. It comes down to, yeah, I, I tell my students all the time, we get to play make-believe for a living. How cool is that? Cheers, dude. That's fantastic. All right, bubba. Take care, mate. Talk, talk to you soon. Please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes. We're now on iTunes and uh, other major podcast directories if you're an iTunes user. I myself am an Android user, and uh, I use an app called Pocket Cast, which is pretty cool because uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts. So uh, go check out that if you can, and you can subscribe, obviously, because then you don't miss any of it. Uh, our podcast is called Battles with Bits of Rubber because basically that's what we're always doing. We're fighting with problems and trying to overcome problems with stuff, and that's basically what we're all about. Check out Battles with Bits of Rubber on iTunes and other podcast search engines, and you will be able to subscribe. Uh, also, one other thing to mention is to check out, there's a video of me. I actually mix up some different skin tones in silicon with pigments to go along with this article, because uh, I realize, obviously, talking about it and having pictures is all well and good, but actually seeing someone take some uh, translucent silicon and actually pigment it to different skin shades using these techniques is quite handy to actually see done in real time. So I've done a video of that. So go check that out. I will put links to that on this uh, blog post and on for this podcast so that you can find that. Uh, and again, as well, if you have any technical questions, do check us out. Our technical questions and feedback we love at Stuart and Todd at gmail.com.